In this tutorial, we will be discussing electronegativity and polarity. You may have noticed that oil doesn't combine with water. So, have you ever wondered why? Something about water molecules causes them to bunch together into one region, expelling the oil molecules into a separate region. So let's take a look at water. The two bonds between oxygen and hydrogen each consist of an electron pair. The two electrons shared between oxygen and hydrogen. The oxygen and hydrogen atoms each donate one electron to the electron pair. However, they don't share them equally. The oxygen atoms takes, takes more of its share to the electron pair, so the electrons tend to drift towards the oxygen. This is called electronegativity. The ability of an element to attract electrons within a covalent bond is electronegativity. So the more that an element attracts that electron, the more that it pulls that electron closer, the more electronegative it is. Oxygen is more electronegative than hydrogen which means that, on average, the shared electrons are more likely to be found near oxygen than hydrogen. And that's all because oxygen is more electronegative. So consider this representation of one of the two OH bonds. The oxygen atom getting the larger share of the partial negative symbolized negative, partially negative. So it has more of the share of the electrons because the electrons are being drifting towards the oxygen. The hydrogen atom has a more partial, has a more positive charge. So it's signified with a partial positive. These letters here are actually Greek letters. And just like the American alphabet, the English alphabet, where we have lower, big A, lowercase a, big B, lowercase b, this is a lowercase delta. Uppercase delta looks like a triangle. Lowercase delta looks like an S that just keeps going, or a figure eight that didn't quite get shut. And so that's called delta t, delta positive, delta plus, delta minus. However, instead of saying delta, we say the word partial. So the hydrogen is partially positive, while the oxygen is partially negative. The result is an uneven electron sharing is a dipole moment, a separation of charge within the bond. Covalent bonds that have a dipole moment is called polar covalent bonds. The magnitude of a dipole moment and the polarity of the bond depend on the electronegativity difference between the two elements in the bond and the length of the bond. For a fixed bond length, the greater the electronegativity difference, the greater the dipole moment and the more polar the bond. The value of electronegativity is assigned using a relative scale on which fluorine, the most electronegative element, has the electronegativity of 4. Linus Pauling introduced the electronegativity scale used here. He arbitrarily set the electronegativity of fluorine to 4 and computed all the other val values in comparison to that. So here's our scale. Fluorine in the upper right hand corner of the periodic table is the most electronegative. As the atoms, as the elements get closer to fluorine, they become more electronegative. As they get further away, they become less electronegative. We talked about periodic trends already. The periodic trend is that the ionization energy increases as you get closer to fluorine because it takes more energy to take the electron out. That's because the electrons are getting pulled towards the atom. 
So these are related topics. If two elements with identical electronegativities form a covalent bond, they share the electrons equally, and there is no dipole moment. In chlorine Cl2, the two chlorine atoms share the electrons evenly. This is a pure covalent bond. The bond has no dipole moment because no chlorine is more electronegative than the other, and so there's no pull on the electrons. The molecule is called nonpolar. If there's a large electronegativity difference between the two elements in a bond, such as what we see with a metal and a nonmetal, the electron is completely transferred and the bond is ionic. So here's sodium chloride. The Na completely gives up its electron to the chlorine. So we have, with the polar covalent, we have it in the middle between these two extremes. If there's an intermediate electronegativity difference between the two elements, such as between two different nonmetals, note that we're still looking at nonmetals, then the bond is polar covalent. So here's an example of hydrogen fluoride. The electrons are shared, but the sharing of the electrons are more likely to be found around the fluorine than around the hydrogen. So therefore, the electrons are drifting towards the fluorine. Notice they have this symbol here that we talked about earlier, partially negative, which is leaving hydrogen partially positive. So we can put this on a continuum. On the left hand side, we have purely covalent bonds, nonpolar. On the far right, we have ionic. That's where the, at the metal gave up its electron to the nonmetal. In the middle here, we have polar covalent. It's the halfway point for them. In order to be ionic, the difference in electronegativity has to be between 2 and 3.3. For nonpolar, it has to be a very small difference from 0 to 0.4. Polar covalent is everything else, the difference of everything else. So does the presence of one or more polar bonds in a molecule always result in a polar molecule? The answer is no. A polar molecule is one in which the polar bonds that add together they do not cancel each other out, form a net dipole moment. When a di diatomic molecule contains a polar bond, then the molecule is polar because there's nothing to cancel it out. For molecules with more than two atoms, it is more difficult to tell polar molecules from nonpolar ones because two or more polar bonds may cancel each other out. So let's take a look at carbon dioxide. If we find this on the periodic table, carbon and oxygen, that's a bad periodic table. Here's oxygen, here's carbon. Oxygen's closer to fluorine than carbon is. So oxygen is more electronegative. So that means in reality, the electrons are gonna drift towards those oxygens. Each bond is polar because the difference of electronegativity between oxygen and carbon is 1.0. However, CO2 is a linear geometry. The dipole moment is one bond completely cancels out the dipole moment of another. And the molecule is then nonpolar. Notice down here, they're going in exact opposite directions. We can represent polar bonds with arrows or vectors that point in the direction of the negative pole and have a plus sign at the positive pole. So if we look here, that's what was written down here. The arrow was going towards the oxygen because it was more electronegative. There was a positive sign underneath the carbon because it was less electronegative, leaving it partially positive. If the arrows or vectors 
point in exactly opposite direct, opposing directions, as in carbon dioxide, the dipole moment cancels out. In the vector representation of a dipole moment, the vector points in the direction of the atom that is partially negative. So let's take a look at water. It also only has two bonds. But now let's look, it's now oxygen and hydrogen. Once again, if we look at the periodic table, oxygen's fairly close to fluorine. Hydrogen's over here, although it's a nonmetal, probably ends up right here as far as electronegativity. But the difference is 1.4. So therefore, it's still considered a polar bond because of the difference of electronegativities. Oxygen is more electronegative than hydrogen. Water has two dipole moments, but they do not cancel out in this one. Therefore, the whole molecule is polar. So because it's a bent molecule with these lone pairs up here, as the electrons drift towards the oxygen, it has an overall polarity going through the oxygen. And it's because of the fact that it's bent. If it was linear, they would cancel out. But because of those, elect those lone pairs making it bent, they're not able to cancel out. So here are some generalities. So assuming that the same element is on either side of the bond. So if these were both chlorines, if they were both oxygens, if they were both sulfurs, whatever. Assuming that these are the same, they would be pulled at the same amount. Same with trigonal planar. When we start looking at trigonal pyramidal, when it gets pulled away, there's nothing up here to cancel it out. And same with bent, there's nothing down here to cancel it out. Tetrahedral, assuming once again that they are identical, they end up canceling out because they're canceling it out in all four directions. Water molecules are polar. The molecules that compose oil are generally nonpolar. Polar molecules interact strongly with other polar molecules because the positive end of one molecule is attracted to the negative end of another, just as the south pole of a magnet is attracted to the north pole of another magnet. A mixture of polar and nonpolar molecules is similar to the mixture of small magnetic and non-magnetic particles. The magnetic particles clump together, excluding the non-magnetic non -magnetic ones and separating into distinct regions. Similarly, the polar water molecules attract one, an one another, forming regions from which the nonpolar oil molecules are excluded. So how does soap work? Because that's going to actually be closely related to the mixing of nonpolar and polar. After eating a greasy cheeseburger, your hands are coated with the grease and oil. If you try to wash them with only water, they remain greasy. However, if you use a little soap, the grease washes away. Water molecules are polar, and the molecules on the composed of grease and oil are nonpolar. As a result, the water and grease repel each other. You might also notice this when you look at puddles after a rainstorm. A lot of times you'll see it looks like water is actually bubbling on top. Be because of the fact that the oil from the cars are on the road, and so they're not mixing together. One end of the soap molecule is polar. That's right here. The, while well, the other end is nonpolar, and that's right there. What happens is that the polar head of the soap molecule attracts to the water molecules while the nonpolar tail strongly attracts to the grease and oil molecules. Soap allows water and grease to mix, removing the grease from your hands and washing it down the drain. So as you rub soap on your face or on your hands, it, the oil is getting mixed in with this nonpolar area. Then when you're ready to rinse off your hands or rinse off your face, the polar head attaches to the water, and as the water brushes against your face, it pulls all this pol nonpolar tail along with the other oils 
with it and folds it off your face. And that's how soap works. And that is the basis of electronegativity and polarity.